Hello, Gretna family. My name is Gregory, and I am a member of this church. Today, I have been asked by Pastor Rob to present a message to you. So I'm going to be sharing something God has had on my heart for quite a while. I have been blessed to be a part of this body for a, a few years now. But until recently, I struggled with addiction in the form of alcohol, in the form of alcoholism, self-harm, and porn addiction. I have not been silent on this, but rather have been truthful in my pursuit of change. And I have been clean and sober from addiction for close to nine months now. One of the things that really struck me in these last few months is how alcoholism and other addictions aren't nearly the only things that prove to be addictive and harmful to us in one form or another. Whether it's shopping, gambling, attention, popularity, all of it fills the same role. And that's when it finally hit me. Addiction is sin disguised as something else. Because at the end of the day, addicts are trying to fill God's place in their hearts with something else. And we're also guilty of that, even when we've never been an addict before. The way that I've been able to be freed from my addiction is through a 12-step recovery program. And I feel that these first few steps that we in anonymous groups follow to get past our addiction can easily be applied to everyone in their journey to Christ. In fact, that, in fact that's why the title of this message is Salvation in Three Steps how the principles of recovery apply to all of us. The first three steps for recovery are ones that I like to call heart steps because they deal with the attitude of our hearts as we navigate the path of recovery. I once heard a story which might help to kind of clarify it a bit, and it certainly helped me to clarify it. A man was having a hard time with getting started in recovery. He'd started going to groups, and he'd even gotten a recovery Bible and was reading it. But the biggest problem was he couldn't figure out how to move forward. So he called his sponsor, a person who's been through the steps themselves and is meant to help guide him in recovery. And he says, I just don't know what my problem is. And so the sponsor <laughs> tells him to go in the bathroom and look in the mirror and asks him what he sees. And this guy says, I see myself. And the sponsor says to him, bingo, you're the problem. I mentioned this story because the first step goes right into this issue, admitting that you have a problem and that most likely you're the source of that problem. Step one states, we admitted that we were powerless over our problems and that our lives had become unmanageable. In John 8, 34 through 36, it says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free. You are truly free. Jesus himself is the truth that sets us free. He is the source of truth, the perfect standard of what is right. He frees us from the consequences of sin, from self-deception, and from deception by Satan. He shows us clearly the way to eternal life with God. Therefore, Jesus does not give us freedom to do what we want, but freedom to follow God. As we seek to serve God, Jesus' perfect truth frees us to be all that God meant us to be. Sin has a way of enslaving us and controlling us, dominating us and dictating our actions. Jesus can free us from this slavery that keeps us from becoming the person God created us to be. If sin is restra restraining, mastering, or enslaving us, Jesus can break its power over our life. The Bible says that when we commit sin, we are slaves to sin. This raw imagery is meant to illustrate our position as captive to it. We are captive in our sins. We don't like to admit it, but at the end of the day, it is not we who choose to sin, but rather the sin that chooses us 
it's sin that chooses to make us a servant of it. However, when we choose to turn our lives over to Christ, and when we are freed in Christ, now we serve Christ in new life. We are a servant to him. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, 20 through 24, it says, hold on, give me a second. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. You see, slavery was common throughout the Roman Empire. Some Christians in the Corinthian church were undoubtedly slaves. Paul said that, on the, that although they were slaves to other human beings, they were free from the power of sin in their lives. People today are slaves to sin until they commit their lives to Christ, who alone can conquer sin's power. Sin, pride, and fear no longer have any claim on us, just as a slave owner who no longer has power over the slaves he has sold. The Bible says we become Christ's slaves when we, when we become Christians. But this actually means we gain our freedom because sin no longer controls us. We are created to serve the Most High, but sin corrupts us to serve only the flesh. But when Jesus frees us, we are able to serve the Most High again. That is the first step. And the second step is a bit more important in my mind. Step two says, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now, in the literature, especially the original literature of AA, it says a power greater than ourselves. And in a lot of people's cases, that can be the group, that can be um, somebody else that has um, the ability to hold them accountable. But, you know, in my book, it says, you know, a power greater than ourselves, and then it directly, it directly references Jesus and God, because, you know, Jesus is the only one that can restore us. In fact, in Revelation 21, 5, it says, and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making all things new. He's making all things new, restoring us not as we were, but to new life and to new sanity. Flesh is insanity. When we serve our sinful nature, we are insane because we're serving sin that corrupts and that kills. But when we turn our lives over to God and we come to believe that God can help us be sane again, when we believe that God can give us new life again, that's when we become sane again. God is the creator. The Bible begins with the majestic story of his creation of the universe, and it concludes with his creation of a new heaven and a new earth. This is a tremendous hope and encouragement for the believer, because when we are with God, with our sins forgiven and our future secure, we will be like Christ. We will be made perfect like him. You know, there's a quote from, I, from Einstein that says, insanity is doing the same thing again and again, expecting a different result. And when we, in our sinful nature, before we came to Christ, continued to do the same, sin, the same sinful things, expecting it to fill us, expecting it to give us what we wanted, what we were desiring above all else, we were giving into our own insanity. We were because at the end of the day, not one moment of that life before we came to Christ was ever going to give us what we truly wanted or needed in our lives. 
Step three, we made a decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. Turning over our lives takes surrender. Surrender is a very difficult thing. In war, surrender is often the last resort because up until that moment, you keep fighting. You keep fighting because you think, if I can just push one more inch, one more foot, one more, then maybe, maybe this will, this will, you know, get us where we need to go. But no, when we're in sin, it doesn't matter how much we fight, we're still going to lose. Then surrender is an act of complete obedience. Surrender isn't, isn't just about giving up. It's about obedient obeying what God says. If we think about it um, from an Old Testament perspective for a second, when sacrificing an animal according to God's law, a priest would kill the animal, cut it into pieces, and lay it on the altar. Sacrifice was important, yes, but even in the Old Testament, God made it clear that obedience from the heart was, was much, much more important. In fact, in First Samuel 15, 22, it says, But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. God wants us to offer ourselves, not animals, as living sacrifices. Daily laying aside our own desires to follow him, putting all our energy and resources at his disposal, and trusting him to guide us. We do this not out of obligation, but out of gratitude for, our forgiveness, for the forgiveness of our sins. If you are given forgiveness, would you not be eternally grateful? And would you not give everything you are to be able to see that you that you honor that forgiveness that you honor that um you know that gift of forgiveness that gift of everything that you are being forgiven despite you knowing for a fact that you didn't deserve it one bit i myself i am eternally grateful for my salvation in any way possible I, I do everything I can to serve God because God is the only one that could have forgiven me and he did forgive me. So <laughs> that is the uh, that is the biggest thing that um, God has ever given me and I can never repay that but I can always honor that gift. Romans 12.1 says, sorry, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You present yourself as a living sacrifice to God, not only a living sacrifice, but also a constant sacrifice you know pastor rob says it um at least every once in a while um what's the hardest part about being a living sacrifice when we try and crawl off the altar right you know <laughs> it takes obedience to continue to be a living sacrifice despite all of our sinful earthly nature saying no 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 no, no. i just want to do what i want to do I just want to do what hell, what makes me feel happy. Well, sometimes what makes me feel what makes me feel happy isn't helpful. It isn't helpful. <laughs> Obedience and sacrifice, turning our will over to the care of God, means dying to ourselves. And not only that, sometimes it takes us actively killing the old nature that we used to have. I myself have had to go back and literally put to death a lot of my old behaviors because they weren't beneficial. 
I know that it is said, it's written in the Bible that, you know, while everything is perm permissible, not everything is beneficial, you know? And it was talking about, you know, eating, sac eating food sacrificed to idols and other things, but, you know, it can be just as easily to say, just as easy to say that about watching that entire first season of that Netflix show instead of, you know, cracking open our Bibles for for an hour on a Saturday afternoon or on a Friday evening or whenever we have the time, you know. It can be easy to say, oh, well, I've got no time because I'm always at work or I'm always doing stuff with my kids or I'm always there, here, there, and everywhere, but do we really not have any time or are we just not prioritizing as much as we could be? I know I don't. I know I should, and I know I'm doing much better than I used to, but I also know I fall short many a time. <laughs> Dying to self, killing the old nature, you know, reminds me of uh, the story of Lazarus. In fact, in John 3, sir, John 3, 3, there we go. <laughs> Got confused. Um it said, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus himself said that we have to die and be born again. You can't be born again unless you die first. The reason why we practice immersion baptism. Now, I know in um, the Brethren tradition, it's trine immersion but even just singular immersion has the same kind of, you know, um, picture, I guess. When we enter the water, our old man is dying. And we, when we raise up out of the water, our new man is born. It's a symbolic gesture, but it's also a, a, an obedient gesture that says that, you know, we are dead to sin and alive with Christ. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The new has come. It has. There is, there is hope in that statement. There is the fact that my old man, my old nature has gone is a blessing, is a blessing to me and to the ones that, that I hope to witness to. Finally, in Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ, and so now I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And what does the Bible say? He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Christ lives in me, and he is greater than anything that this world has to, has to take up arms against me. If God is for us, who could be against us? You can take that to the bank. You can cash a check with that. Spiritually, I mean, you know. God wants us to live into that, to live into that promise that it is not us who continues to live, but rather Christ who lives in us. And so today, I have some applications that I want to share with you. Number one, what is holding me back today from accepting Jesus' gift of salvation? And how can I acknowledge my part in letting go of my old self and be born again. You know, I, I often ask myself that question for years. What's holding me back? And you know, the only true answer was me. 
because the only one who can truly stop me from accepting God's free gift of salvation is me. Because neither life nor death nor powers nor principalities nor anything here or you know anything on this earth or anything beyond this earth can separate me from the love of god but first i have to choose to accept it i have to cho choose to say yes god i accept you as my lord and savior i acknowledge your lordship over my life and i accept the free gift of salvation that you died and paid for Secondly, are there secret or hidden sins that I'm carrying which are poisoning my relationship with Jesus? What steps can I take to turn away from it? Now, this is harder. This is harder because honestly, from my perspective, being honest with myself and, and letting myself know that, yes, I'm still holding on to things is hard because I've still got resentments that I carry that I'm dealing with and I'm letting go day by day and I've still got other things that I'm that I'm holding against myself that I should not if God has forgiven me why don't I forgive myself that's the biggest question that a lot of people ask themselves that's the biggest question that I've heard in a lot of these conversations with people is you know I can't forgive myself I know God's forgiven me but I can't what makes it greater than God is when I often ask myself and other people. I've asked myself that more than once. What steps can I take to turn away from it? Well, first of all, it takes forgiveness. It takes forgiveness of yourself if you've done something wrong, and it takes forgiveness of the other person. And first of all, the biggest thing is forgiveness isn't for that other person. Forgiveness is never for that other person. It's always to set you free. The Bible says the measure which, with which we forgive others is the measure by which we are forgiven. And if we are unforgiving of other people, then God is not going to forgive us because, you know, he's not going to give us something that we're not willing to give to other people. It starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with ourselves being able to say, I forgive me for what I've done. And then thirdly, finally, have I truly turned my will and life over to God to care for me? And have I seen results from it? I think that's the biggest question that I think anyone can ask themselves is, have I truly turned my will and my life over to the care of God? And have I seen results? I can truly say that I have. Nine months ago, I was I was deep in immoral sin and insane thinking and insane behavior. And it took God's help and Pastor Rob's prompting to get me to admit that I had a problem and then also to deal with it. And God can do the same for you if you ask him. God is faithful and will give us what we ask if it's in his will. God will. He will give us what we need in times of trouble. And he always gives us a way out from temptation if we take it. But we have to take it. We have to make that decision to take the exit instead of staying in the room with the temptation. So I just want to offer a prayer, a very simple prayer. God, right now, we ask that if there is anything that is holding us back from serving you better, serving your whole heart, wholeheartedly, or just serving you in general, we ask that you would make that known to us and make that something that we can actively pursue that we can actively let go of our resentments, actively let go of those things that are holding us back from serving you better, whether it's sins that we haven't been able to shake. We ask that you break those chains right now. 
You are a you are a gracious God. You are a powerful God. We know that you break down all barriers between us and you. We know that you tear down strongholds. We know that you break chains. We know that you heal the sick. Lord, for all those that are struggling right now with sins of any kind, I pray that you would give them freedom from that. And for those that struggle with addiction, that you would give them the peace that only you can possess, that only you can give, that they would find you and that they would find freedom. For it is not just substances that we can be addicted to, but it can be anything that is not that is not good and that we use in the place of you. That is addiction in a nutshell. We thank you for your free gift of salvation. And if anyone who is listening to these words has not yet accepted that free gift, I just pray that they would accept that right now. That they would accept that right now so that they might be free as well. We thank you for this time to bless your name, praise your, praise your majesty, and just glorify what you've done for each and every one of us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you once again for joining us. And I will see you, we will see you again next week. God bless you and have a wonderful evening.